Thank you for auditing the always positive New Music Review Show, hosted by a French professor who's still figuring out these new microphones. Hopefully, you can actually hear me this time. I'm going to be reviewing the new album by Mick G, Two Star, and The Dream Police. Now, that's MK.G, not to be confused with Mick G, the director of Charlie's Angels and the videos for All Star by Smash Mouth, Might As Well Be Walking on the Sun by Smash Mouth, and Pretty Fly for a White Guy, which was not made by Smash Mouth, but probably could have been. Now, I've gotten a few requests to review this album, primarily because my just insane love of that album by Dijon, I guess I'll call it Dijon, I suppose that's how it's probably pronounced here in America, and just how much I love that album, and this is one of Dijon's main collaborators. And weirdly enough, like two days ago, I had a dream. And in the dream, I was in LA, and I was with my friend, uh, I was at my friend Mark's house, but it was like a little apartment. And, and it was like a, a late night party, like 3 a.m. And we were waiting for these vaudeville performers to arrive, sort of like a Don Bonderlay situation. And I like had to leave, I had to go be with my family. But he said, you know, Dijon's gonna be coming by here to watch. And so I like stuck around in this weird, uncomfortable like loft space, waiting for the vaudeville performers to show up so I could hang out with Dijon. I tell you that sort of dream-like story, it's very true, I couldn't come up with something so boring, uh, like, I tell you that because it actually fits pretty well with this very dreamy album. It's very similar to Dijon in a lot of different ways. It's so similar that it's like hurting me because now I just, I feel like I need to, I'm a music cricket, right? I'm a full-time French professor, that's my job. But in my spare time, the hobby I picked up in the lobby, I'm a music cricket. I want to name this thing. What is this thing? Because, you know, they sound the same in the same way that, I don't know, Dylan and Baez sounded the same, you know, kind of folk. Like, whatever it is, this kind of music that they make, how do I define it? Well, if you look up on, on uh, Bandcamp, the way they define themselves, the way Mick G divine, defines himself is as indie funk. I don't know. I mean, it is kind of funky. It is indie. Okay, sure. But I've come up with a new one. Okay, I came up with a new, brand new genre title for this kind of music that is guaranteed to, to go absolutely nowhere. I call this Backstroke of the West music. What is Backstroke of the West? If you don't know, uh, there was a Chinese translation of the movie Star Wars Revenge of the Sith. It came out in 2005. I think it was from a bootleg. You know, someone filmed the screen and then translated it into Chinese. Someone had the brilliant idea <laughs> to use machine automatic translation from Chinese back into English. What this did was it created something that looked a little bit like the original, but was just wholly different because it had passed through these multiple filters to arrive at this moment. As an example, uh, we'll have uh, uh, Supreme Chancellor Palpatine sitting in his chair and he says to Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker who have come to help him, get help, you're no match for him, he's a Sith. To which Obi-Wan replies, Chancellor Palpatine, Sith Lords are our speciality. The way this gets translated in Backstroke of the West is, you too, careful, he is a big. Mr. Speaker, we are for the big. Okay, that's the way it got translated. Sith Lords are our speciality was translated as, we are for the big. Now what does that have to do with Dijon? What does it have to do with McG? This music feels to me like the next stage of layers of transformation of vaporwave music. So vaporwave music, I guess it was really popular like a decade ago. I don't know. I, I was too busy trying to get tenure. I wasn't paying attention to it. I'm pretty late to the game. But as I understand it, as I understand it now, primarily, you know, it's taking old, especially sort of like 80s, kind of cheesy, soft rock, soul, not quite funk, because it's not trying to be funky, sort of like Peebo Bryson style music, and then slowing it down or speeding it up and adding filters and adding sounds and, and just making it this bizarre dreams-like scape. So I call this music Backstroke of the West because what it feels like to me is that this is music where McGee 
retranslated into normal music a vaporwave song. So let's take like uh, you'll uh, be in my arms again by Peebo Bryson. Let's imagine that that's warped by uh, vaporwave. To be in my arms again. Okay. This would be like, what if someone heard that slowed down and said, well, let's just re-record that. Let's keep those feelings. Let's keep that dreamlike atmosphere. Let's keep that distortion and that coolness, but just make it a straight song. That's what this feels like to me. This feels like a bunch of covers of 80s songs that never existed. And the cover is of the vaporwave style of that song that didn't exist. Now, what's lost in that retranslation? Well, thankfully, we've lost the kitsch, the camp, the nostalgia, but the things that we kept is just this gauzy atmosphere. And what we've reinserted is this very soulful singing. Now, I think I prefer Dijon's voice. I think maybe he goes a little harder, but it's similar enough and it's just good enough that I still really enjoy this. And when we're thinking about what kind of covers are these, right? <laughs> these original songs, which are covers of songs that have never been written, it's like there's this whole vibe and it, it feels like muffled bedroom covers. And in particular, the skill that these folks have mastered is the skill of the room mic. Let's see, let's see if I can do it, okay? This is the mic I'm using. I'm gonna put it over there, okay? So like, if I try to talk to you about this album, from all the way over here, you're gonna get all sorts of ambient sounds. I don't know why I'm talking like Kermit the Frog and Jordan Peterson, okay? You're gonna get all sorts of different sounds. You're gonna get all sorts of ambiance. These guys are absolute masters of room mics. In general, when you're recording, it's a, it's a real trick, okay? Like we're living in this world of direct input, which means you get the cord, you plug it into the computer, get the other cord, you plug it into the instrument, everything will become digital immediately, okay? Before, back in the olden days, you know, you wanted to record a guitar, you had to put a microphone in front of an amp, thereby whatever the guitar does, that goes on the record. Whatever the amp does, that goes on the record. Whatever the chord does, that goes on the record. Okay, all these possible places of distortion, of sound, of layers, of atmosphere, etc., can all be thrown onto the record. So now that we live in a time where people's voices can be pitched through a computer to the point where I'm gonna sound like a boomer, this is all fine. I'm cool with all this, okay? I'm cool with, with, with the auto-tune. I'm not against, I don't believe in death of auto-tune. Jay-Z was a little bit wrong on that one, a lot bit wrong. Like, this is a logical rejection of that fact because unlike most other singers, both of these guys, just seem to put a microphone 20 feet away and just allow the sound of the room and the sound of their voice to make enough to fill so that that room goes on the record. Their room, their bedrooms, wherever it is they're recording, is on the record. And it creates all that great atmosphere. I also, so help me, okay? I'm not an expert on this stuff, right? I'm, <laughs> I'm wearing a three-piece suit, so you think I'm an expert on everything. I'm really not. I'm an expert on some things. What does Steve Lacey have to do with all this? Because Steve Lacey, I feel, is obviously his work is more work. It's a little bit less atmospheric. It's not quite in there, but still, I get a lot of the similar kind of warbled. It's like guitar music that is as far from cock rock as you can have, you know? I have been having this whole debate with a friend of mine on, on Facebook about like guitar music and kids today aren't picking up guitars. And of course they are, but we're just very far away from the kind of cock rock guitar you know, that, that I had growing up. Instead, it's a sort of very ethereal, it's like, <laughs> it used to be when I'd plug in a guitar and the natural sound that just came out of the pickups, right? If you had a Stratocaster, you have a couple single coil pickups, just the, Beato, just the kind of sound that you have coming out of there, Finity, the kind of sound that you have coming out of there is just like weak and thin. And you like, I, I gotta get a pedal. I gotta get distortion. I gotta do something to it. Like that weak sound, like there's something about an electric guitar, the way that it's plugged in, it sounds like a, 
like a calf that's just been born and the way that it walks on its feet all wonky. This school, what I call backstroke of the West rock, and, and it's, it's, you see backstroke of the West is how they translated Revenge of the Sith, but it's also because Dijon and uh, McGee both work in LA and so does Steve Lacey, so there you go. Anyways, I, I, I really appreciate this vibe. It takes a lot of work. So as a 46 year old guy who's, who grew up on cock rock, it's hard. Um, there's no definition of cock rock, by the way. It's just Led Zeppelin. <laughs> okay. If you can imagine Led Zeppelin, that's what it is. Okay. Just that, that kind of feeling. Uh, it, it's funny because in a way this takes as much effort as like, you know, rage rap or hyper pop. It's something that feels so much of its moment that it takes me effort to get into because it has that difficulty, just I can't, it's so dreamlike. And it's not even like shoegaze, which I sort of get. It's shoegaze adjacent. It, I guess, it's backstroke of the West. Is he saying anything in this album? Are there lyrics in this album? I think it's important that he's not. I think that's part of the idea of the whole thing is that he's not saying that much but I'll talk about that. So as I get going here, if you like this video, smash the like bucket. If you're one of the people who sent me like, like uh, Instagram messages and, and I think on my Patreon, you know, give yourself a shout out in the comments and I'll say, yeah, that's right. You did tell me to review this because I've gotten a lot, a lot of requests to review it. I, I appreciate it. You're probably, you're always right when you think I should review something. Um, unless it's that new, uh, <laughs> You know what? I think I might. I think I might have to make a video of that new weekend song. I don't care. It's so bad. It's so bad. Okay. So I'm going to give you my stamp, an example song. Uh, click above Picasso's lovers for the song. Dnm. Dnm. D N M. I don't know if that stands for denim. True story. The history of denim comes from a time when uh, wool was more expensive than cotton. So they started uh, the the. Uh, the people who worked in sort of fabricating fabrics, primarily the largely Jewish population of the city of Nîmes, uh, created this kind of new fabric that was called denim. That's why it's called De Nîmes, from the city of Nîmes. Third, thirdiary fact, uh, Nîmes is also the best place to see Roman ruins in the world because they're very well preserved as part of the Roman Empire. Okay, going back to denim. 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 So why did I pick this song? Well, one, it's co-produced by Dijon, and I like that. You know, it's really fun when you have multiple artists who work together and they work with each other and you get the sense, you know, you get the sense they hang out and like they work together and they like each other. And it starts off with the sound of a tape starting and stopping and it feels like to me, like maybe this is someone pressing play on a recording that they did of this weird radio station they found in the middle of the night back in 1988, okay? These beautiful vocals, again, very Dijon-like, cool little drum loop, very far away. It almost breaks into um, the Isley Brothers feel, you know, Between the Sheets, the song that uh, would become this, the basis of the song uh, Juicy by uh, Notorious B.I.G. But then there's this really cool rhythmic thing with <laughs> so, There's a thing where if you're living, if you're a bachelor, and I'm not going to gender it, I'm, I'm sure there's lots of single females who have also had this experience, um, and your your uh, your fire alarm goes like low batteries, it makes this loud cheap, <laughs> and you can really tell when you're doing poorly in life if that cheap has been going for more than an hour. Okay, like how close you are to your objective in life is directly correlated to how long you allow a a a, a fire alarm battery warning to cheap. Uh, that joke is slightly adapted from Madame Corolla. He used to have a really good bit on that before he got all weird and pragery. Um, anyway, so it has that kind of like cheap and too cheap, but I think it's probably just a wood block. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it feels like sometimes they record, like it feels sometimes like they record it, like they're taking a microphone and holding it up to a computer microphone. Like it's that kind of far away. And these beautiful little moments with this piano slow, piano solo just playing these notes on the on the offbeat it gets really quiet and this loud quiet bit with piano and then at the very very end it's like they switch the channel on the on the tape and we just get this whole other soft rock ballad for like two seconds this like planetarium music sound 
that really plunges you into this world. I'm going to go through the rest of the album a little bit quicker. Opening tracks called New Low, Cool, Messed Up, just hyper pop, bedroom pop, backstroke of the West, indie funk. I don't like it. Um, nice little kind of whiny noise in the background, almost like a garage drum beat in the background. Just very jitter, jilted, jittery drums. Uh, nice little emphasis of this kind of like sound in the left channel. Uh, it's a very, this is maybe the most playful song on here. Yeah, every now and then you hit a new low. I don't, I don't think he's trying to say a lot. I don't think it matters that he doesn't, but I don't think he is. Next track's called How Many Miles, another automated cool drum line, very 80s bass feel. The thing about all this, and this is true of uh, Lemon Twigs as well, who's not at all a similar group, but like Lemon Twigs imitated music that I don't like. <laughs> this music imitates music I don't like, which forces me to recontextualize my dislike. Like, maybe I need to go to the record archive and pick up some Peebo Bryson. Right? I mean, maybe. You know, maybe the kind of soft R&B, like, airy, gauzy hits of the 80s translated so well into something as cool as Vaporwave because the material was all there. And I was just ignoring it because I was too busy listening to, I'm going to say it one more time, everybody, I was too busy listening to Cock Rock. I was raised by a cup of coffee, all right? Let me give you an example. This song reminds me strongly of Bruce Hornsby. Now, if you are under the age of 100, you don't know who Bruce Hornsby is. He, the 80s, the 90s were a weird time where someone like Bruce Hornsby could be a pop star. He's probably best known now for being the guy that wrote the song, That's the Way It Is, that Tupac sampled for his posthumous hit, The Way It Is, the worst Tupac song arguably one of the top five worst hip-hop songs of all time. Absolute trash. Not even Tupac can save it, because it's based on that terrible sample of Bruce Hornsby, who really wasn't the worst, but he had these kind of like soft rock, sincere little ballads from the 80s. Actually, the, my first Grateful Dead concert, he was playing, uh, he was playing keyboards, uh, Oakland, 1990. But it but again, when McG does it, I like it. That's the backstroke of the West. That's the, the, the retranslation of this kind of cheesy thing from another way, just another added filter to it. You think it's going to go nuts with the drums, but it doesn't. It just hits the chorus. Very cool melody, all these muffled instruments, this beautiful instrumental break that kind of blasts and then kind of fades away. I don't think I've ever heard bass or guitar sound like this before. So I'm challenging you again. After the little solo that's on here, tell me if you've ever heard that bass and guitar sound ever before. After all this time, I thought that I lost me. After rising up, I thought that I lost me. It's not that he's saying nothing. It's that what he's saying is so vague that it can sort of apply to everything, which I think is the way it has to be. I think if maybe that's the difference between him and Dijon. I felt a lot of Dijon's life in Dijon's music. Here, I don't feel like a person's life as much as I feel it's almost an instrumental album with words, which is not an insult. It's just a different way of approaching it. Or maybe I am not smart enough to see the deeper themes, in which case tell me in the comments, okay? Are you looking up? Again, this feels like it's in that kind of Lacey Lane gar, gar guitar, gar, <laughs> gar guitar, 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 gar guitar. I've got a doctorate. Uh, warbled guitar played super well, just a little more straightforward. Like it feels like it's going to be more straightforward of a song. And then we get this insanely compressed second verse with this beautiful, this is my favorite singing on the album, very raspy singing, very catchy, very catchy, very cool chorus. Is it poorly recorded or perfectly recorded to sound poorly recorded? It doesn't matter anymore. So are you looking up? Are you asking why? Because if you want to go, then baby, go wild. Yeah, I can shift shapes, but I can't deny, baby, we can put it all to rest just for one night, sort of uplifting the bedroom. Did he do that thing? Are these lyrics, lyrics translated into another language and then translated back? <laughs> yeah, I can shift shapes, but I can't deny, baby, we can put it all to rest just for one night. Um, 
but it's very clear, very charming, and then there's a the sound of a of a blades. Weird. Then we get the stamp. Didum. Then you got it. Kind of staccato, cut up sounds. The guitar is like very cool bass hum here. You really need headphones for this one. The whole album is just so gauzy and vapor wavy and just far out there. It seems like the lyric is a joke. Long as you are loving me, ooh ooh, you don't want it, girl. Riley and I, odd distorted sounds. Kind of a badass pulsing sound here. It's a little bit more modular than other songs on the album. Uh, I, I sort of want it to turn into something more. I guess it's about someone named Riley. I don't know. Next track's called Candy. Uh, this, with the title, it's very clear. It's trying to make you think of a song like, I want candy, right? <laughs> okay. I'm going to, oh, Jesus. This is why music crickets are insufferable, because I'm going to make a point that I'm making on the fly, and as I'm thinking about it and buying time by doing this little preface, thinking if I really think it, like I'm embarrassed of it because it's so cheesy, but I'm going to say it anyways. I think cheese music is, a, is as if Candy Says by Velvet Underground and the pop song I Want Candy had a child together. It, it kind of... It, it kind of holds up. It's kind of a good way of putting it, right? Wait, can yeah, there's a song called Candy Says. Yeah, okay. I, I had Stephanie Says stuck in my head. And Jane Says, for that matter. Uh, what is it about junkies and songs about girls saying things, women saying things? Uh, I, I This, again, like, are you sure? Are you sure this is not a cover of a song from the 80s? Are you positive this is not a theme song? Are you positive this is not a cover of a theme song to an 80s detective show about a woman named Candy who lived in St. Louis and was like a private detective after getting a divorce who lives with her lives with her best friend from college and her son. Okay? Are you telling me that's not that this is not the theme song to that song to that that TV show? Cuz I think it is. Candy is all my business and if she's looking hard she will find it. Candy, you're just wasting time. Next track is called I Want Kind of a nice sort of droning beat there. Guitar slowly grows over it, plays a little bit of like the harmonics on the guitar. The second part gets more insistent. At a certain point, there's some saxophone. McGee really likes the restraint, which is weird, because if you've seen Charlie's Angels full throttle, the man does not like restraint. But now that he has been reborn into a Zoomer guitar player, actually, I think the original McGee is still alive. <laughs> I feel like we should try him at The Hague for the Pretty Fly for a White Guy video. Oh, man. It was rough. It was rough. There's a lot of great stuff in the 90s, but there was also Pretty Fly for a White Guy. There's some saxophone in here. Like, what's going on there? Like, maybe we can get more saxophone. This feels a lot like uh, I'll Be Watching You, I'll Be Missing You, whatever the, whatever the police one was, not the Puff Daddy one. Just I love this big moment in the middle of the saxophone because it's like this indication of what it could be, but then it's not. Next track is called Alisis. I think that's named after the, the microphone company, right? Maybe that's the kind of microphone that he has 40 feet away while he's recording his album. Actual drums happening here. Actual kind of a bop, sort of a beat, sort of a normal beat here. Kind of ghostly sounds in the back and has this like really rangy vocals. He's doing a lot more with his vocals here. Like, hey man, he's holding out on us. He's doing all sorts of stuff here. I'm in another body who's in somebody else, both of the headless and heartless dancing with themselves. I, I don't know, but I love the way that he sings the words, do you find it? Next track's called Break the Spell. And it reminds me a little bit in its chord progression of the song Crimson and Clover, which might be sort of the er text of all this kind of vapor wave stuff. Do you know the song Crimson and Clover? Uh, prominently used by David Fincher in uh, Zodiac. It's a great psychedelic kind of one-hit wonder from the late 60s that I think is a good template for the kind of spacey, psychedelic, gauzy, dream-like world that a lot of this kind of music puts us into. I don't know if that's on purpose. Um, it could be filler. I don't know. Like, it's hard to tell because the album's so much about atmosphere that a lot of things could be filler. A little bit more. Uh, haven't decided clear as day. Uh, okay, this song right here. I don't know why I wrote the lyrics and just said some of the lyrics there. That's weird. 
this is maybe the most ambitious song because the guitars, the guitars are doing like these weird arpeggiate, like arpeggiated things, these little curly compressed things that are matched with like the vocal sometimes and then there's some piano in the background it's very rolling and nice and contemplative maybe this is about something maybe this is about art come on little luck come on lightning you know the feeling that you need to catch lightning in a bottle to make art and then the final track is called dream police which of course uh, is a cover of the, uh, the the cheap trick song called dream police it's not but there is a great song by cheap trick called dream police I'm now going to quote one of my favorite sets of jokes from probably my favorite episode of The Simpsons. Homer, haven't you ever heard, you, haven't you ever listened to yourself on tape? Homer, I prefer to listen to Cheap Trick. Well, here, say something. Hey, this is Homer Simpson saying howdy to all the girls out there in Radio Land. It has nothing to do with Cheap Trick. But it's interesting because Cheap Trick is sort of a parody of the kind of cock rock that this isn't. <laughs> so I don't know. This is what I'm hoping. I'm hoping that, that at the end of this, you look up Peebo Bryson and you look up Cheap Trick and you enjoy some good music. This is a nice ending to the album, kind of like gentle sounds with some fretless bass, very sweet, sweet singing. Again, the lyrics feel like they've been retranslated. I'll bleed tonight. She lit the world on fire. The dream police is alive. Don't you dare say to me, come on, girl, dance for me. <laughs> he is a the big. The big. So there you go. There's my review of McGee. I hope it was everything that you were hoping for. Because I'm talking about Star Wars and retranslation, I want to show you um, my favorite item here uh, that I keep in my office. So this is a little piece of history. So 1977, the Loire uh, saint Ean in Canada passed, which forced there to have... Uh, French written on all boxes, like on all packaging. So this was very early on because, you know, Star Wars came out in 1977. So you see this properly translated, like Guerre des Etoiles, but you see right there, they messed up and they spelled Guerre with a Q, La Quere des Etoiles, because it's hard to translate. It's hard to translate things properly. And it's hard to, have, uh, hard to have correction, which is why you need to learn another language, which is why we all need to be bilingual so that I can have a job still. All right. Till next time, there's the camera.